Thank you very much. Uh, and congratulations uh, to everyone who did their best to put together this very interesting conference. Uh, I'll start right off. Lord Byron once remarked that he had always supported parliamentary reform, but he resented those who advocated it, that is radicals and reformers. Even so, during his la last years in London, he was a member of the Radical Hampton Club. Furthermore, he had even presented a parliamentary address in support of Major John Cartwright, a prominent figure of the reform movement. Later in his life, when he remained in self-exile at Italy, Byron appears to have become more uncertain and reserved towards the possibility of a social revolt in England. It is in those years when an intellectual confrontation was taking place between Byron's patrician prejudices and the revolutionary and romantic, romantic tendencies of his youth. Concurrently, Byron was able to sponsor the Carbonari nationalist, nationalist schemes. The main question is how these different attitudes by the same person may be reconciled. How can this prima facie incongruities of Byron's thought be resolved? If one wishes to comprehend the change in Byron's political line of thought between his youth and later years, it is prudent to examine it within the historical and social context of Regency England, and I, pro and I propose not to that of continental Europe. Today, I shall endeavor to present, necessarily in a very brief fashion, Byron's opinion of the Regency reform movement. My examination ranges largely from 1813 until 18, uh, 1823, when he sailed for his last and final journey to Greece. What I argue is that in this decade, Byron's political ideology, the very term may be debated, of course, shifted from a radical to a more conservative position that was closer to the political thought of the Foxite wings of the 18th century. The apparent change in Byron's ideological and political outlook can be verified through the comparison of his earlier stance on reform and his expressed opinions in Italy. To that end, in the first part of my presentation, I shall quickly refer to his early involvement with the Hampton Club and his third speech in uh, Parliament respecting Cartwright's petition. Then I will record certain information taken from Byron's later correspondence on issues related to reform and revolution in England. It is my aim to indicate that Byron, a Foxite Whig in his youth, turned radical of the genteel kind in the years between 1813 and 1816, eventually reverted to his ideological origins after leaving England. Thus, his example serves a case study of the ideological interplay between realism and idealism in this transitional period of the reform, reform movement in Regency England. A word on methodology, the methodological framework adopted here has, been, has greatly benefited by Malcolm Kelsall's analysis of Byron's politics. It is maintained that Byron's thought may, may well be divided into two areas, that is between affairs abroad and affairs at home, and the polar between theory and practice. Examined under this light, Byron's actions and thoughts about the reform in England may be elucidated further. Byron was very active at the House of Lords uh, during 1812 and 1813. By the summer of 1813, he had already delivered two senatorial speeches, one in favor of the Luddites at the Midlands and another advocating further relief for Catholics. His maiden speech was quite a success. Byron was then an aspiring politician in, a, in an age when political careers were also made in the Lords. When Spencer Percival became prime minister, after a brief attempt of the Whigs to form a government, it was clear that Byron's party was doomed to remain in opposition. After Percival's assassination, another friend of the king, Lord Liverpool, was sworn in as prime minister. At the start of his political involvement at London, Byron had become a member of the moderate Foxite Holland House. Of course, Foxite Whigs carried the legacy of Charles James Fox, the prominent parliamentarian of the late 18th century. Frustrated with the Whigs' inability to return to government, he gradually disassociated himself 
from the Holland House and became involved with a more radical Hampton club named after the legendary Hampton who had once defied the king himself. In this context, Byron's third and final parliamentary oration was essentially a presentation of a petition on behalf of Major Cartwright, the London radical, who was abused during a meeting at Huddersfield while attempting to, assemb to assemble signatures for his parliamentary reform petition. The reform movement um, in Regency England was not only supported by London radicals, it was also advocated by those called the genteel reformers. That is, members of the aristocracy and the upper class, like Sir Francis Burdett, an MP and very wealthy man, who was even imprisoned for his participation to the reform movement, becoming a hero for London radicals. In this transitional period, two decades before the enactment of the first Reform Act, one could be a reformer without carrying the necessary implication that he was also radical. Furthermore, we have to remind, remember that at, at least until the end of the Napoleonic Wars, radicals most of the times were ascribed with the label of Jacobinism and were considered a fifth column within the realm. After a failed attempt by Samuel Whitebread to present Cartwright's petition for parliamentary relief to the Commons, Byron's friends at the Hampton Club pressed him to present the petition in the Lords. At first, Byron was reluctant to do so. Already his personal affairs were in priority and he was starting to be dis disillusioned with politics. Nevertheless, after much pressure, one of the, on the 1st of June, 1813, Byron stood in the Lords to defend Cartwright. It is his shortest and least memorable speech, and the one that was delivered with a sense of duty, but with no real motivation. This is indicated by Byron's approach on his speech. Much, much of the time was spent in legal arguments and technicalities in favor of Cartwright. Only a few things were said about parliamentary reform. Perhaps the most, important, the most important utterance was Byron's reference to a very famous motion by Baron Ashburton from the 1780s, the known phrase that the influence of the crown has increased, is increasing and must be diminished. That way, Byron transcribed an 18th century debate to a 19th century context. Recall that he did exactly the same many years later, when in the vindication of judgment, the protagonist in George III's trial are Jack Wilkes and Junius, mid 18th century political figures. For Byron, Cartwright wanted more people to be represented in elections, reform proposals that if were enacted would benefit the people and the political system. But throughout the speech, Byron appears more concerned with Cartwright's right to present a petition rather with the content of the said petition. This is also Whig locus classicus, as since the accession of George III to the throne, the Rockinghamite and other Whig factions utilized petitions for their political cause. Some days later, after delivering the speech, which was a total failure and brought no result, Byron was convinced that he would not succeed in politics. In September, he wrote the famous lines to Lady Melbourne that revealed his feelings, and I quote, "'Tis said indifference marks the present time, then hear the reason, though it is told in rhyme, a king who can't, a prince of Wales who don't, patriots who shan't, and ministers who won't, what matters who are in or out of place, the mad, the bad, the useless, or the base." One may recognize the political players behind Byron's lines, George III, a king, a king who can't, Prince, will, uh, Prince Regent who does not, ministers, opposition, all are either mad, either bad, either useless, or either base. Moving on, Byron's self-exile at Italy not only covers a significant part of his lifetime, it lasted seven years, but it is also perhaps the phase of his life during which political issues preoccupied his thought heavily. They also influenced his poetical production with the publication of political and satirical poems like the two Foscari, Marino Fagliero, The Age of Bronze and The Vision of Judgment. These poems directly or indirectly relate to political events in England, events which Byron followed from distance but with an acute interest. Recurring themes in these poems are revolution, social and national, 
the position of the aristocracy, the various incongruities and inconsistencies of Byron's own political beliefs. The conservative turn regarding reform politics at England and the radicalization concerning continental affairs on the poet's part is observed during these years and verified by various scholars, amongst them are Roderick Beaton, Malcolm Kelsall, and Peter Cochran. Can these different attitudes be reconciled? How, on the one hand, Byron supported the Carbonari and the triennial liberal in Spain, but resented the, Lon the London radicals? As it will be shown throughout this period, Byron made a vital distinction between affairs at home that influenced his own social and financial standing and the revolutionary movements abroad. Byron's Italian phase signifies two important things. On the one hand, Byron's copious efforts to remain loyal to the Whig party and landed aristocracy of England, and on the other hand, his attempts to resolve the political and social dilemmas affecting post-Napoleonic Europe. In Italy, as we all know, Byron met Shelley and his wife Mary upon his arrival. Shelley, of course, was much more radical than Byron, a self-declared atheist and follower of William Godwin, Shelley certain, certainly influenced Byron's thinking on continental affairs and the battle of liberal nationalists in the Iberian Peninsula and in Greece. But it is important to underline that when he had to deal with Italian, Spanish, or Greek affairs, By Byron was free of the various inconsistencies and problems that afflicted weak thought throughout the Regency problems that had first originated from the split of the Whig party at the outbreak of the French Revolution. At the same time, Byron, the aristocrat, could support the liberation of an oppressed people, but he could never advocate social revolution or the radical redistribution of landed property as it had happened in France. His innate Whiggism could not allow that. Beaton agrees that even in Italian affairs, Byron was not ready to overthrow the social status quo in favor of a radical social revolution. That's perhaps the reason why he eventually fell out with the Carbonari. Another prominent Byronist, Cochran, always advocated that Byron had remained loyal to his aristocratic roots to the end of his life. Writing to Hobhouse during these years, Byron asserted that he could only agree with moderate reformers like Mirabeau and de Lafayette, both had aristocratic origins. Commenting on the French Revolution, he declaimed against Marat and Robespierre, labeling both as ruffians. This is the way he writes it. This was when he wrote that he was not against reform, but against reformers, radicals, and other politicians of that sort. Byron's moderate and prudent stance and its inherent ideological problems can be observed in the heroes of Fallero and Foscari, both written during this period. This is, uh, these are poems re that refer to failed revolutions, to eventual submission and compromise. This is where Beaton saw Byron the reluctant radical, even though the poet would ascertain to Stahope that he was never a radical while they were arguing at Missolonghi. The Peterloo massacre, as it became known, is the turning point in Byron's thought on revolution at home. It is when we find in his correspondence phrases written in a weak vein, like, I believe that the revolution is inevitable, although I'm not a revolutionary. I want the British constitution to be restored and not destroyed. He even reached the point to say, what have I to win from a revolution? A member of the landed aristocracy, why my fort with my fortune invested in funds? Byron, like many of his compatriots, remained convinced that this was not only the start of a broader revolutionary movement, but a motion that could be culminated to actual social revolt, like in the case of the French Revolution. Byron is scared that he might lose his wealth and his social standing. He does not want to see a social revolution spread to England. This can be perceived as a cynic's stance. Cochran has proposed that Byron was not afraid that he might lose his landed property. After all, he had all, already sold the Newstead Abbey. Instead, he feared government instability that might affect the bonds he had invested in. This was very different from advocating the liberation of the Greeks or the unification of Italy. This would affect him personally and directly. 
Those fears went hand in hand with his conservative turn. He now believes that reform will come as a product of the organic development of the British constitution rather than revolution. This is rather Burkean in its outlook and an 18th century Whig argument for that matter. Karl Marx once remarked that it was a good thing Byron died in Greece because if he had lived, he would have become a reactionary bourgeois. Although it is a bit difficult to imagine that a Whig aristocrat could become a bourgeois. Fictional history and what ifs, of course, are not accepted in scholarly, scholarly research, but it is true that even before his departure from Greece, while he was alive, Byron had hardened his stance towards revolution. Instead, he now posed as a staunch advocate of the ideals of the glorious revolution. He admired the British mixed constitution. This can be observed in the allegory in the Ode to, of, uh, to Venice, where the Venetian republicanism of the 17th century serves an analogy to British constitution. Elsewhere in Marino Fagliero, the old dog is the persona of the poet. The dog, yeah, the dog is ready to die for his ideals and he remains loyal to his aristocratic principles. He is in favor of the rebirth of the Republican state of Venice and not of a, quote, proto-socialist, end of quote, republic. Byron writes about not race equality, but of equal rights. This is again very close to traditional weak thought, and it is very far from Tom Paine's notion of equality. Again and again, we find Byron as a conservative, weak aristocrat in his later correspondence with Hobhouse. Since his exile from England, Byron lived politically through Hobhouse's political career. He was very much interested in his friend's success and he always advised him to the point of sometimes patronizing him. Hobhouse is Byron's proxy for his involvement in the political affairs of England. He wanted Hobhouse to succeed in the arena of politics where he had failed. And when his friend was elected as an MP, Byron wrote an anti-Jacobin Balanda, very critical of Hobhouse, who had associated himself with a mob and abandoned the Whigs. His friend had even been imprisoned in Newgate for a pamphlet he had written. Byron was always dismissive of his friend's political alliances in England with sick, vulgar, and blackguard reformers. When he had first failed to be elected, Byron had bitterly written to Hobhouse that, quote, I had much at heart your gaining the election, but from the filthy puddle into which your patriotism had run you, I had my bondings. Although Hobhouse had lost the election not because he was too radical, but because he was not radical enough. He had actually dismissed the importance of parliamentary reform in a speech he had delivered. He labeled Hobhouse political friends as low associates, ragamuffins. Hobhouse imprisonment was an embarrassment for Byron because according to Leslie Marchand, this was not the gentlemanly, sick, way of leading the people. Again and again, he rejected reformers, although not reform. He even spoke of code low, designing dirty levelers who would pioneer the way to a democratic tyranny. Note the use of the word levelers, a word originating in the English civil wars. He wanted Hobhouse with the moderate Foxide Whigs and not with the London radicals. At least he wanted him to work with the genteel reformers like Burdett. And in the same ballad, we read, who are now the people's men, my, Bob, my boy Hobio? There is I and Burdett, gentlemen, and Blackguard, Hunt, and Cobio. There is I and Burdett, gentlemen, he writes. Byron was a Tory, was no Tory, excuse me. He might have been critical of the Whig party, but he still believed that it was the only liberal party in England, as Marchand has observed. He equally despised royalist high church Tories and black guard radicals. He accepted his dilemmas. He writes that anything that comes uppermost and call it my dictionary, Difficult to say whether hereditary right or popular choice produced the worst sovereigns. Still more difficult to say which form of government is the worst. All are so bad. As for democracy, it is the worst of the whole. For what is in fact democracy and aristocracy of blackguards? 
not the democratic tyranny of the French Revolution then, but the republicanism of the United States, his model of power, freedom, and moderation. It is no wonder why someone like Carlyle could write about Byron that he was, in so much as he was a lord, as he was, le he was less than a man. Another instance where Byron's conservative stance respecting British affairs can be observed is in the case of the Cato Street conspiracy, a conspiracy of London radicals to murder members of the cabinet. When some members of the conspiracy were executed, Hobhouse labeled them as heroes. Byron, on the other hand, had no sympathy for those people and thought that his friend was involved in deadly games. Overall, Byron's stance is typical of the Regency Whig, notwithstanding some poetic peculiarities. He had no problem working with Burdett, an aristocrat like him, but he would never associate himself with radicals and who he called blackguards. David Erdman wrote that the incident of the conspiracy for the murder of Lord Harrowby was for Byron the best and most vivid example of what social revolution could meet, mean for people like him. It might not be a coincidence after all that he started writing Marino Fallero a few days later. I believe that Byron's stance on British reform affairs and continental revolutions must be examined separately for a conclusion to be drawn. I'm of the opinion that he was very much aware of his own inconsistencies, but it was not enough to adopt a wholly revolutionary approach, serving the same standards both at home and abroad. The proposed dichotomy between home and abroad, theory and practice, may well serve to resolve further Byronic inconsistencies or discrepancies, like those observed in the case of the free press or his opinion of the Greeks. Further research into Byron's conservative turn in his later life may also be a novel way to look at his political thought in general. Thank you very much for your attention.